Good to see all of you here this morning. Uh, my name is Steve, as Rick said. I'm from the North Shore, and, and I'm uh, so glad to be here. Great to hear those stories. Uh, I love to hear stories like that, and uh, uh, just seeing how God works, and uh, you know, sometimes just unknown to us, and then you'll look back and you realize all that he's done. It's so great to hear those kinds of stories. I um, want to just welcome all of you here, especially if you're visiting with us, and I know we've got more visitors on the island, so it's good to see all of you here, and those of you who are watching um, on the internet or on your TVs, we welcome you, and uh, those who are going to watch this and later on this week, I welcome you also, and I'll probably look at myself and critique myself, so <laughs> I'll, I'll be one of those. So, um, Could you be just join with me in prayer before we look into God's Word? Father, thank you. Thank you so much as we've heard these stories of how you are working all around this world. You are working in the midst of all of us. And Lord, uh, we confess that a lot of times <clears throat> we don't even see how you're working until somebody else points it out or we look back and we see what you have done. So help us, Lord, to always have a heart that's full of thanksgiving, a heart and eyes that are anticipating what you are doing, and to encourage one another and to realize that you are the God of all this world, that you are in control of all things, and that we can trust in you. So thank you, Lord, for speaking to us, and we pray now that you would speak to us through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as most of you know, if you were here last week, we started a series on Matthew. The preaching team is going to be going through the Gospel of Matthew, and Tony did a great job, and... Uh, if you haven't heard his sermon, you need to do that. He, he preached on the beginning of Matthew, the genealogy, and uh, that, that's often a hard, hard place to preach, a genealogy, but uh, the genealogy is fantastic, and he did a great job and <clears throat> showed how Matthew was tying Jesus Christ to everything that God had been doing through history, and tying Jesus Christ to the son of Abraham and son of David, and showing his connections there through the genealogy. But he also highlighted how, through Jesus Christ, God can redeem even the most terrible, irregular, and most scandalous situations. And if you look at that genealogy, you'll see the four women who are named there, and each one of them, there's some scandal involved there. And yet God used them through history to bring his own son to this earth. We need to realize that Matthew, when he was writing... And many believe his writing maybe 60, 70 A.D., probably from church at Antioch. And we know that, that Christianity started in Jerusalem. That's where the disciples were, and that's where the first church was formed. But it was in Antioch that the church really kind of moved. And that was the church that became the larger church, even than the church in Jerusalem, because the Jerusalem church was under persecution. And so the Antioch church was the church that was the mission-sending church. That's the church that sent out Paul and Barnabas and sent out all kinds of missionaries. And, and many believe that Matthew was writing from there. And as, as a Jew, he wanted to write the gospel of Jesus Christ, the story of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, so that both Jews and Gentiles would understand it. And that's why we have this genealogy, because the genealogy tells the Jews that this man, Jesus, is connected to David. He truly is the one that God had promised and sent as the Messiah. But because he also included those four women, all four of those women who were outsiders, not Jewish people, Matthew was saying, hey, you Gentiles, God knows you, he loves you, and you are a part of his story, a part of his work, a part of his plan. And so that theme continues on as we go through the book of Matthew. And, and so this morning, we're going to be looking at the next section. If you, if you know anything about Matthew, you know the next section is what we often call the Christmas narratives. And we're familiar with these passages. The last part of Matthew chapter 1 talks about how Joseph and Mary were engaged, and Mary was pregnant, and Joseph was wondering how in the world did she get pregnant because it wasn't through me. Remember the story how the angel came to Joseph? We all know that story because we're familiar with Christmas. We put out our, our Christmas um, um, displays, and we remember all the traditions, so we know those stories. And then in Matthew chapter 2, we have the the magi, or what we often call the wise men, they come to see Jesus. And remember that story, how they saw this star, and they, 
had this vision from God, this, this word from God that the, that the son of David had been born in, well, they weren't sure. And that's why they came to Jerusalem. They asked the then king, King Herod. And can you imagine somebody coming, you're the king, you're the king of this land, and you think you're a great king, you're, thing, you're the best king, and these wise men come and they say, hey, uh, we, we heard that there was going to be a king, king of Israel to be born. You can imagine him saying, I'm the king. I'm right here. And they said, no, 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 it's a baby. And, and you know the story, how he inquired with the religious leaders. They told him, well, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And so he was able to tell the Magi about that. But then the Magi, because God told them, said, hey, don't go back to Jerusalem. Don't tell Herod where Jesus is, because all Herod wants to do is kill Jesus. So we know that story. But this morning, I want to kind of hone in on three different stories that are coming at the end of the chapter two. And they are part of the Christmas narrative, but they're not the ones we put in our Christmas story. They're not the stories that we have displayed, the ones we talk about at Christmas time, because they're not the ones that kind of give us those good feelings. They're not the ones that kind of put us in that Christmas mood, and yet they're part of that Christmas narrative. We know that after the genealogy, all these things happened. Jesus was born. But today I want to highlight the parts of the Christmas story that usually are not the parts of the Christmas tradition. So let's begin in chapter 2, verse 13. This is the first episode or the first incident. You can follow along on the screen or you can open up your phone or your Bibles and you can follow along as I read. Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 it says, when they had gone, that is the, the wise men, the magi, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I call my son. So that's the first episode. It's Jesus' family going down to Egypt. Now you have to realize in those days, because Herod was the king, and we're going to talk a little later about how terrible he was, how vicious he was, and how cruel he was in the things that he did, and because of that, many of the Jews were under persecution through him. Many of them didn't want to be around there, and so they would go away. They would become refugees, and one of the places they went to was Egypt. And usually if you had money, that's where you went. You could go there, you could travel freely. It seemed like they had open borders for all Israelites to come in. And so obviously that's where Joseph decided to take his family, to go down into Egypt. So that was a common thing to do, but Joseph and Mary probably did not have a lot of wealth. Uh, some traditions say that, that he, they used the gold that, that the Magi gave them to make this trip. We don't really know that, but I'm sure this was kind of hard for them to go to Egypt. Even though the borders were open, even though that was a, a good place for them to go, they were still refugees. They were escaping a situation that they knew might be dangerous for them. And it's interesting how Matthew takes this situation and he quotes a scripture from the Hebrews scripture, from the Hebrew scripture. And you'll find in the three episodes, the three incidents as we look at, that's exactly what he does. And all through the book of Matthew, Matthew is constantly saying, this is what the prophet said. This is what was written in our scriptures. And that was his way of showing to the Jewish audience, hey, everything about Jesus is nothing that's new or something that is, is so out of line with what God has done. In fact, it's exactly what God has planned all along. This has been God's plan. This has been God's work. And that's why you should look to Jesus as your Messiah, trust in him, for he died and rose for you so that you might have eternal life. So... So Matthew says, okay, here's what the scriptures say. And this is from Hosea chapter 11. It says, out of Egypt I called my son. Now we know that that's a reference to the nation of Israel. And so right away Matthew is making a connection between 
be, uh, between Jesus and the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was the chosen nation of God. Jesus is God's chosen person to bring salvation. Israel was the avenue through which the rest of the world was to be blessed, was to encounter the salvation of God. Jesus is the one through which the world will be blessed and through the world will experience the salvation of God. So we see that, that Matthew is connecting these stories to the history of Israel, to the plan that God has already had. So that's the first episode. The second episode comes in verse 16. And this one is one of those episodes that we don't like to read about. So follow along. It says, when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now, I don't, even though we don't have a lot of time this morning, don't, don't skip over this incident. It's a terrible incident, yes. Here's, here's a king who is so vicious, and some have said, well, did, did Herod really do this? And those people who want to discount scripture, because we have no other historical record of this. But if you look at the man Herod and what he did, you realize this, this would not be surprising for the types of things he had done. He had had a, a brother-in-law of his killed through drowning. He had a number of uh, political officials cudgeled to death. He had some of his sons strangled to death. And just before he died, he had another one of his sons executed. In fact, the saying was that it was better to be Herod's pig than to be Herod's son. And that's the kind of man he was. So because he was like that, this kind of story is not, not to not be believed. And so it's a terrible story of what is happening. And in many ways, Herod is the epitome of evil and that, that's what Matthew is showing here. This is, this is the evil that is going on in the world, even when the son of God, the son of Abraham, the son of David comes on the scene. Even when that person comes that we celebrate at Christmas time and we have the, the beauty of Christmas and we are all touched and our hearts are warmed, and yet at that very moment that Jesus was born, all these babies were being killed. And that's the kind of person Herod was because when, when the Magi came and said, hey, we're looking for the king of Israel, we're looking to, for, for the king who is the son of David. You see, when Jesus is king, then we are not. If Jesus is Lord, then we are not. And that's what Herod realized. And Herod was a very insecure man, and that's why he did all the things that he did, and that's why he ruled the way he did. And so you can imagine that here's this little baby that even their religious leader said he was born in Bethlehem and this is what the prophets have said. Instead, he said, I don't want this and I want to get rid of him. And that's how evil he is. It's so easy to look at a person like that as we look at so many other people in this world that have done evil things and terrible things and it's so easy for us to kind of say, wow, that is so evil, that is terrible, I would never do anything like that. And chances are you would never do anything like that. But the reality of evil is in the heart of every single man. And the same question that Herod had to face up to when the Magi came and said, where is the king of Judah, where is the king of Israel, where is the son of David? We have to confront the fact, Jesus, is he our Lord? Or are we gonna turn away like Herod? Are we gonna say, no, I wanna be the Lord of my life. I wanna be the one who controls my life. I wanna do the things that I wanna do. I don't want somebody telling me what to do or somebody saying, this is how I ought to live. And so every single one of us have to confront that same reality we realize that when you begin to hate the child, you end up hurting humanity. You end up not only turning your back to God, but you turn your back against your brother and sister because God is the one who says, come to me, I give you life, and that life can spread to other people in joy and peace and love. 
So we see that, again, Matthew connects this to a scripture, then this one from Jeremiah 31, and this was when the nation of Israel was going into Babylonian captivity, and it talks about Rachel, who was the wife of Jacob, Jacob being the father of the 12 sons that became the nation of Israel. She's the one weeping over her children going into Babylon. What's amazing, though, if you finish reading in Jeremiah 31, right after all that weeping, it says that all these people will eventually return and God will establish a new covenant with his people. In the same way in the first incident where it says that out of Egypt I have called my son, notice that Matthew quotes that scripture when they go into Egypt, not when they come out. It's like, hey, they're going into Egypt, but don't worry, they're going to come out just like Israel came out of Egypt, that was their salvation, coming out of Egypt, going through the Red Sea, going to the Promised Land. And same way with Jesus, Jesus has the promise of God that despite all the circumstances around him, all the terrible things that are going on, that, that God will still complete his purposes. So the third incident, verse 19 of chapter 2, notice what it says after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. When he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth, so was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. So again, we have the story. They come out of Egypt. They settle not in Bethlehem or around Jerusalem, but they go to Galilee, which is up to the north, and they go to a tiny little town of Nazareth. Now, that scripture that he's talking about is nowhere to be found in the Old Testament. But the idea is this. He says he's going to be called a Nazarene. He's from Nazareth. He's basically saying he's going to be called a nobody because nothing good comes out of Nazareth. It's such a podunk, small town that nothing, nobody cares about it. So in a sense, Jesus grew up in his childhood in a place that was unknown. It was away from all the hustle and bustle of life. It was away from the halls of leadership. It was away from all the things that go on in Jerusalem with the, with the religious leaders and with the political leaders. And the Old Testament scriptures, the prophets talked about how the Messiah would be unknown in a sense until he came on the scene. And so this is the fulfillment of that scripture for somebody to call somebody, oh, he's a Nazarene. It's as much as saying he's just a a jerk from some small town. And that's what was happening to Jesus. You know, as I think about these episodes, I'm, I'm drawn to thinking about how God relates, first of all, obviously, to his own son as his son was born on this earth. But then how God relates to his whole creation. Uh, hearing the stories from Alaska Christian College, it's, it's just amazing. But, you know, that's how God works. And God is doing that everywhere. And, and this, this is something we have to always remember, that God is in control. We sang a couple of songs that talked about how God is the Lord of all things, that he is in control of all things. This is the theological doctrine that we call the providence of God. The providence of God is how God sustains and guides and directs and is continually involved in his creation and in every part of his creation to fulfill his purposes, which is to proclaim his glory and to bring about the salvation of his people. When we talk about the providence of God, it begins in the fact that God is the creator. And that's not a scientific statement. That's not a statement of science, but it's a statement that shows that there is purpose and meaning to life because God has created things. And so if God has created things, he also sustains it. Not only has he created it, but he sustains and he cares and he guides. God is not like the watchmaker God of deism, the God who creates the world, winds it up, and then goes away somewhere. But God is involved. The God of Christianity, the God of the Bible, is one who is involved in his creation, involved in all parts of his creation. 
the God of the Bible, the God of creation, the God who sustains, the God who is the God of providence, is not the impersonal spirit of pantheism or Eastern religions that basically says that God and the universe are the same thing, that obliterates all personal uniqueness because we're just supposed to go all into one spirit. And so you can see how the God of the Bible is one who is outside the world because he created the world, but he is so involved in the world. God is involved in his creation and for that, we can thank him. But God's providence is one of love and compassion. When some people think of God controlling, that's a negative thought in their mind. Because when they hear those words, God in control, or anybody in control, they don't like that. They don't like the idea of maybe somebody who's in control of them. But look at this passage from Psalm chapter 145 that talks about the kind of control that God gives. Yes, some people refuse to believe God and to follow him because they see God as dictatorial or as overbearing or critical or judgmental or controlling. Well, this is the kind of controlling he does. It says, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is, look at this phrase, good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. This is verse 15. You open your hand and you satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. So when we think about the providence of God, when we think about the fact that God controls everything, that he is in charge we should also realize that he comes in that facet, in that way, in that position with loving kindness and compassion, seeking the good of his creation. That's an amazing thing when you think about it. Because most people, when they think of God, they think of an overbearing God. But the God of the Bible, the God of creation, the God of Jesus Christ comes with loving kindness and compassion to his creation. And that also tells us that God's providence cannot be separated from his saving purposes through Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, chapter, cha Colossians 1 uh, verses 16 and 17 says this, For in him, that is in Christ, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So we see that it's God's providence is connected to Jesus Christ. These three episodes in Jesus' infancy and in his childhood stories tell, shows us that God was protecting his son, that even in the midst of evil and cruelty, God was there. God was in charge. God knew what was going on. He was making things happen so that his son would be preserved, would be taken care of. And he was taking what to the world seems insignificant and despised and weak, and he was lifting it up to glory. You see, all of life, all of our lives, even the insignificant, even that which is painful and cruel, even our sufferings, the blessings, the protection, the goodness, all those things are in the hands of God. And when you come to realize that, you come to realize how safe it is, how good it is, and how blessed we are. Doctrine of Providence tells me that the world and my life are not ruled by chance or fate or luck, but by God who lays bare his purposes in the revelation of his son, Jesus Christ. Check out this little video that talks about how God's providence is in each of our lives. Do you have that? Or? Okay. Circumstances. Our lives are made up of little circumstances, one after the other, after the other, after the other. On and on the circumstances go. Some circumstances are good, and some circumstances are bad. But either way, on and on they go, flowing through time, leading you a little older as each one passes. In a bad circumstance, you have no perspective and just want it to end. But as seconds, minutes, hours, days, and years pass, your bitterness turns to gratefulness that you had to go through that bad circumstance. 
You wouldn't want to go through it again, but you also wouldn't sell it for a million dollars because God has been orchestrating the natural order of things to bring out his will for your life. And those bad circumstances now look like blessings. God's timing in our life can seem to take too long. It can be frustrating and make you feel out of control. While God is at work through your circumstances, will you trust that he is working out a plan? So we see that the most seemingly insignificant details are governed by God's providence. God is working out a plan. We see that in the genealogy of Jesus. We see that in his infancy stories. We see that throughout his life in the Gospel of Matthew. And you can see it in your life and in my life. And because of that, do not be afraid, but trust in God. Don't be indifferent to God. Don't be rejecting of God like Herod. But realize that because of his providence, you don't need to be fearful. You don't need to worry about things. You can really trust God in everything that you do and everything that is around you. Trust in him. In all things, give thanks. If he's in charge and he's doing these things, as we saw in the video, even the bad things in our life, as time goes on, we can often look back at that and say, wow, God was there. God was showing me certain things. I have grown. I have learned. This has happened. These people saw what was going on and they have come to know the Lord. All kinds of things happen as we look back. That's, that's how the providence of God, when you realize how great it is, is when you look back and see what he's done. And that's why in all things, give thanks before him. And then when you understand the providence of God, step forward with confidence and action. Some people think when you say that God is in control, that that means we just sit back, don't do anything, that the less we do, the better God can do things. No, it's the very opposite. Because he is in charge, because he is in control, we could step out in confidence, we could step out in action and do the things that he's called us to do, even when we fail. It doesn't mess up his plan. His plan continues to go on. But he says, come and be a part of my plan. And we could step out with confidence and with faith. So the providence of God, it may be a great theological word, but it's a word that brings us comfort, brings us a sense of safety and protection, causes us to bring glory to God, and realizing that what he is doing in our lives. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much that you are in charge, that we can trust in you. Thank you that through the life of Jesus Christ we can see this in such an such a explicit way and we thank you for that. Help us, Lord, to look at our lives, to live our lives in recognition that you are our Lord, that you are in control. Why don't we all stand together and I, wish, I want you to just indulge me a little bit. <laughs> you see, the doctrine of the providence of God, I think some of you actually learned it as a child. You learned it when you learned this song. He's got the whole world in his hands, right? So why don't you sing that with me, ready? He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 All right, go forth. Thank you.